Australian lawmakers to urge release of Julian Assange during U.S. visit. A bipartisan group of Australian lawmakers plans to visit the United States to seek the release of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. They will advocate for the U.S. to drop its extradition efforts to bring Assange from a British prison to the United States, where he faces charges related to the release of confidential U.S. military records and diplomatic cables by WikiLeaks. The delegation includes former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce and lawmakers from various political parties. Assange's brother, Gabriel Shipton, expressed concern that the U.S.'s actions were harming U.S.-Australian relations. The Australian delegation intends to meet with members of Congress. Senate officials, representatives from the state and justice departments, and organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union and Reporters Without Borders. Supporters of Assange argue that he is being persecuted for exposing U.S. wrongdoing, while Washington contends that his actions endangered lives. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has expressed frustration over the lack of a diplomatic solution and concerns about Assange's mental health. Despite some congressional support, overall backing for Assange among U.S. policymakers remains limited, and if extradited, he could face a lengthy prison sentence of up to 175 years. Kim Jong-un plans to meet Vladimir Putin in Russia, U.S. official says. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is reportedly planning to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin to discuss the possibility of supplying weapons to Russia for its ongoing war in Ukraine. The exact location of the meeting is not confirmed, but it will take place in Russia. This potential meeting follows reports of active arms negotiations between Russia and North Korea, with Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu visiting North Korea to discuss artillery ammunition procurement. After this visit, Putin and Kim exchanged letters, indicating increased bilateral cooperation. The U.S. has obtained intelligence suggesting further discussions between Russian officials and North Korea regarding possible arms deals. The U.S. has urged North Korea to cease these negotiations and abide by its commitments not to provide or sell arms to Russia. The U.S. warned of potential sanctions against individuals and entities facilitating weapons supply between the two countries. Potential arms agreements could involve significant quantities and various types of munitions from North Korea to support Russia's war efforts in Ukraine, which would violate multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions. The U.S. is committed to countering Russian attempts to acquire military equipment from North Korea or any other state supporting the conflict in Ukraine. Kim Jong-un anticipates continued discussions, including diplomatic engagement with Russia at the leadership level. This development comes after high-level delegations from both Russia and China visited North Korea in July, marking their first visits since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. During these visits, Kim provided a guided tour of North Korea's weapons and missiles to Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. This warning about North Korea potentially supplying weapons to Russia follows previous concerns about Russia's procurement of rockets and artillery shells from North Korea for the war in Ukraine, as well as the use of Iranian-made drones by Russia in targeting Ukrainian towns. S. Korea spy chief, Russia sought to broker joint exercises with China and Korea. In July, Russia reportedly attempted to facilitate joint naval exercises involving China and North Korea, according to South Korea's intelligence chief, Kim Kyu-hyun. This offer for three-way naval exercises was allegedly made during a visit to North Korea by Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu in July. The exact timing of the proposed naval exercise is not clear, South Korean National Intelligence Service NIS, officials believe that Russia's offer may have been in response to Operation Ulchi Freedom Shield, a major annual joint military exercise conducted by the United States and South Korea. The operation took place over the final 10 days of August. North Korea has consistently criticized such joint military drills, viewing them as preparations for an invasion. U.S. and South Korean officials have emphasized the defensive nature of these exercises, which have been conducted for 23 years. This news comes after North Korea conducted a simulated tactical nuclear attack on Sunday, using mock nuclear warheads to convey its nuclear capabilities as a warning to the United States, as reported by the country's state news agency. More than weapons would be riding on Kim Jong-un's train journey to meet Vladimir Putin. Kim Jong-un's reported plans to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin this month highlight his willingness to cultivate Moscow as a strategic partner to counter U.S. interests. Kim, who is known for his security concerns, rarely leaves North Korea and prefers train travel over air travel, 
If Kim indeed travels to Vladivostok for the meeting, it suggests that the engagement with Putin goes beyond a simple arms deal and reflects a deeper alliance of convenience between two pariah states. Both North Korea and Russia see an opportunity to challenge Washington's policies in Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific. For North Korea, which is committed to its nuclear weapons program, closer ties with Russia and China help break its diplomatic isolation and position it as part of a united front against the U.S. Meanwhile, the U.S. seeks greater regional security cooperation with South Korea and Japan. There are concerns in Washington, Tokyo, and Seoul about the potential outcomes of a military cooperation deal between Russia and North Korea. Putin is interested in acquiring North Korea's artillery shells and anti-tank missiles, while North Korea seeks Russia's assistance with advanced technology for satellites and nuclear-powered submarines, as well as food aid. Such an arrangement would benefit both parties. Allowing Russia to replenish its depleted arms supplies and boosting Kim's image domestically while helping North Korea bypass sanctions aimed at curbing its nuclear arsenal expansion. However, North Korea is prohibited from developing weapons using ballistic missile technology by United Nations Security Council resolutions, which have previously been supported by all permanent members, including Russia and China. Tensions within the UNSC over Russia's invasion of Ukraine make it less likely that Moscow will play a constructive role in managing tensions on the Korean peninsula, potentially allowing it to disrupt U.S. interests. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol has urged world leaders to enforce UN sanctions on North Korea and block the country's illicit activities to fund its weapons programs. China and Russia have repeatedly obstructed U.S.-led efforts to strengthen sanctions while being accused of not effectively enforcing existing restrictions. In a further indication of their growing trilateral ties, South Korea's intelligence agency warned that Russia likely proposed joint naval exercises with China and North Korea. President Yoon's call for international assistance in maintaining peace on the Korean peninsula comes two decades after the start of the Six-Party Talks, a diplomatic effort involving the US, China, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, and Russia to address security concerns related to North Korea's nuclear ambitions. In a rapidly evolving geopolitical landscape, it is uncertain whether such diplomatic scenarios can be revisited. New Vanuatu PM to Revisit Security Pact with Australia, ABC Vanuatu's new Prime Minister, Sato Kilman, intends to reconsider a security pact signed with Australia following his recent election to power. The pact was a significant factor in the removal of the former leader, Ishmael Kalsakau, who faced a no-confidence motion in Parliament and subsequently lost a secret ballot to Kilman, opposition lawmakers argued that the security agreement with Australia compromised Vanuatu's neutral status and could jeopardize development assistance from China, which is its largest external creditor. Kilman stated that the current agreement, signed by both countries in December, is unlikely to be ratified by Parliament as it stands. He expressed the need to revisit the agreement, engage in consultations with both Australia and the Vanuatu government, and address any concerns or sticking points. Vanuatu is located in the Pacific and is a focal point of competition for influence between the United States and China in the region. The US and its allies, including Australia, aim to dissuade Pacific nations from establishing security ties with China, especially after China signed a security pact with the Solomon Islands. Kilman, who has served as Prime Minister five times, has previously pledged closer cooperation with China during his leadership. The ousted leader, Kal Sakao, had also sought to expand Vanuatu's international relations following his victory in a general election in November. Pakistani Premier claims U.S. military equipment left behind in Afghanistan is now in militant hands. Pakistan's caretaker Prime Minister, Anwar al haq Kakar, has claimed that U.S. military equipment left behind during the American withdrawal from Afghanistan has fallen into the hands of militants, including the Pakistani Taliban. This equipment, which includes items such as night vision goggles and firearms, has enhanced the fighting capabilities of the Pakistani Taliban, posing a new challenge for Pakistan. The Pakistani Taliban, also known as Tariki Taliban Pakistan, TTP, has intensified attacks on Pakistan security forces in recent months. While they are a separate militant group, they are considered allies of the Afghan Taliban. Following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in August 2021, the Taliban took control of the country, and U.S. supplied military equipment left behind fell into the hands of the Taliban, including guns, ammunition, helicopters, and more. The exact value of the equipment is significant, though not precisely known. 
Prime Minister Kakar did not provide concrete evidence linking the Afghan Taliban and the TTP but called for a coordinated approach to address the challenge of the leftover equipment. He did not criticize the Afghan Taliban, as Pakistan has attempted to establish communication and act as an intermediary between the international community and the new rulers in Kabul. Two anonymous security officials in Islamabad suggested that the TTP either purchased the equipment from the Afghan Taliban or received it as an ally. The TTP has claimed to possess advanced weaponry, including guns with laser and thermal sighting systems, enabling them to target Pakistani troops from a distance. Kakar emphasized Pakistan's commitment to defending its territory against militants but ruled out talks with the TTP as they unilaterally ended a ceasefire in November. Pakistan, a key U.S. ally in the war on terror, has faced economic crises and political turmoil. Kakar stated that all political parties, including the opposition party led by imprisoned former Prime Minister Imran Khan, would be allowed to participate in the upcoming elections. However, Khan is not eligible to run as he is serving a prison term for corruption. Despite his ousting in a no-confidence vote in April 2022, Khan remains a prominent opposition figure in Pakistan. Media, Belgium buys sea sparrow missiles from Germany to deliver to Ukraine. The Belgian Defense Ministry has purchased a stock of short-range Sea Sparrow missiles from Germany, and more than half of these missiles will be delivered to Ukraine. Belgium acquired 14 radar-guided sea-to-air missiles at a cost of €7,000 $7, per unit, which were previously used on a decommissioned German frigate. Belgium intends to donate eight of these US-made missiles to Ukraine, representing a form of military aid that showcases Belgium's support for Ukraine. The missiles have the potential to be repurposed into surface-to-air missiles or used to equip drones. This move follows earlier plans by Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg to send refurbished M113 armored vehicles to Ukraine. Additionally, these three countries are part of an international coalition dedicated to training Ukrainian pilots on F-16 fighter jets, as announced during the NATO summit in Vilnius in July. Putin says he won't renew the grain deal until the West meets his demands. The West says it has. Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that the landmark deal allowing Ukraine to export grain safely through the Black Sea will not be restored until the West meets Moscow's demands regarding its own agricultural exports. This announcement dashed hopes of reviving the agreement during talks between Putin and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The deal, which involves grain exports from Ukraine, is considered essential for global food supplies, particularly in regions like Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. However, Russia refused to extend the agreement in July, citing unfulfilled commitments to remove obstacles to Russian food and fertilizer exports. Despite Russia's complaints, it has been exporting record amounts of wheat, Putin reiterated his concerns, stating that if the commitments were honored, Russia could return to the deal within days. Erdogan expressed hope for a breakthrough and mentioned that Turkey and the UN have developed new proposals to address the issue. The failure to revive the agreement could have significant impacts on countries like Somalia and Egypt that rely heavily on Black Sea grain. Russia appears to be using its influence over Ukraine's Black Sea exports as a bargaining chip in negotiations to reduce Western sanctions. In response to criticisms, Putin mentioned that Russia is close to finalizing an agreement to provide free grain to six African countries and will also ship one million metric tons of cheap grain to Turkey for processing and delivery to poor nations. These developments come amid ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky recently announcing the replacement of Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov. Russia has strengthened its military ties with North Korea, with the possibility of joint war games and discussions on weapons sales, the United States has expressed concerns about Russia's efforts to acquire artillery ammunition from North Korea, with expectations that Kim Jong-un may travel to Russia for further discussions in the near future. Letters exchanged between Putin and Kim indicate that talks on a weapons sale are advancing, albeit at a surface level. Russia appends global grain trade. Russia has solidified its position as the world's leading grain exporter, benefiting from a record harvest and competitive prices, while the conflict in Ukraine has disrupted the global grain market. Ukraine, a major exporter of wheat and other food commodities to developing nations, lost access to the Black Sea route for its shipments due to Russia's invasion. Initially, Moscow imposed a blockade on Ukrainian shipments via the Black Sea but later agreed to reopen the route under a deal brokered by the United Nations and Turkey, which included inspections of ships to prevent them from carrying weapons. However, Russia withdrew from the initiative in July.
The disruptions in the Black Sea region have prompted Ukraine to divert its grain exports through alternative routes, such as the Danube River, trucks, and trains. However, even the river route is not entirely safe, as infrastructure has come under attack, including a recent drone strike on a grain export hub on the Danube. Global wheat production for 2023 to 2024 is expected to be smaller than in the previous year due to the impact of climate change on harvests in Canada and Australia, and consumption forecasts surpassing production by 20 million tons. Therefore, there is strong global interest in Russia's wheat production, with many hoping that Russia's 45 million tons of wheat will reach the market. Russia has become the top wheat exporter, supplying a quarter of the world's wheat exports. It has also built up a significant grain stockpile, and agriculture is now Russia's third largest sector in terms of trade, following fossil fuels and minerals. Moscow has maintained low grain prices to gain a competitive edge and has offered special prices to countries like Egypt, a significant buyer of Ukrainian wheat. Russia's ability to produce and export more grain than any other country has allowed it to redraw trade maps, altering the traditional import patterns of countries. Egypt and Turkey are top importers of Russian wheat, with Egypt importing 80% of its grain from Russia and Ukraine, while Turkey processes wheat into flour for export to the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, countries that rely heavily on bread consumption, such as those in the Middle East and Asia, are most dependent on Russian wheat. Several African countries that import wheat have remained neutral in the Ukraine conflict to avoid upsetting Russia, but they also supported the grain deal as it helped stabilize food prices that had risen due to the invasion. Pope acknowledges his Russia comments were faulty. Pope Francis clarified his recent comments on Russia, which were interpreted by Ukraine as praise for imperialism. He stated that his intention was to remind young Russians of their cultural heritage rather than endorsing political imperialism. In an unscripted video conference with young Russian Catholics, he mentioned historical Russian figures Peter I and Catherine II, both of whom expanded Russian territory, leading to controversy in Ukraine. The Pope explained that his reference to the Great Russian Empire was about cultural depth and beauty, not political matters. Pope Francis also discussed Vatican-China relations, emphasizing the need for better understanding and respecting each other's culture and values. He called on Chinese Catholics to be both good Christians and good citizens. The Vatican has had a tenuous relationship with China, with disagreements over the 2018 agreement on the appointment of bishops and China's sinicization policy and religion. When asked about a potential visit to Vietnam, the Pope joked about the possibility of a future Pope named John Ziv making the visit but indicated that a papal trip to Vietnam would likely happen. Francis mentioned that his ability to travel has become more challenging as he ages, but he will attend a conference on immigration in Marseilles next month and may undertake other trips in the future. Clashes erupt in Sweden's third largest city after another Quran burning and at least three are detained. Clashes erupted in the Rosengard neighborhood of Malmo, Sweden's third largest city, after an anti-Muslim protester burned a copy of the Quran. The protest led to violent confrontations, with protesters throwing rocks and setting numerous cars on fire, including in an underground garage. At least three people were detained during the clashes. The incident started when an anti-Islam activist, Salwan Mamika, desecrated the Quran, leading to an angry mob attempting to stop him. The Rosengard neighborhood has witnessed similar clashes in the past, and banners condemning the Quran burning were displayed during the recent unrest. Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson condemned the violence and vandalism, emphasizing that such actions were unacceptable regardless of the reasons behind the riots. Salman Monika, a refugee from Iraq, has engaged in several anti-Islam protests involving Quran burnings, primarily in Stockholm. Swedish authorities have allowed these actions, citing freedom of speech. However, these Quran burnings have sparked outrage in Muslim countries, resulting in attacks on Swedish diplomatic missions and threats from Islamic extremists. Muslim leaders in Sweden have called on the government to find ways to prevent such incidents. Sweden abolished its last blasphemy laws in the 1970s and has no plans to reintroduce them. Nevertheless, the government is considering enabling the police to reject permits for demonstrations on national security grounds, as part of an ongoing investigation. Biden will nominate longtime aide who worked for the First Lady to become U.S. Ambassador to UNESCO. President Joe Biden plans to nominate Courtney O'Donnell as the U.S. Permanent Representative to UNESCO, the United Nations agency focused on education, science, and culture. O'Donnell is a longtime aide with experience in public affairs, strategic communications, and global partnerships.
She currently serves as a senior advisor in Vice President Kamala Harris's office and as acting chief of staff for Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff. O'Donnell has worked on various national and global issues, including gender equity and countering anti-Semitism. She was also the communications director for Jill Biden during her time as second lady. The U.S. recently rejoined UNESCO after a five-year hiatus initiated by the previous administration, and the Senate must vote on O'Donnell's nomination. China's Fukushima-linked seafood ban is unacceptable, Japan tells WDO. Japan has expressed its strong objection to China's ban on Japanese seafood following the release of treated water from the Fukushima nuclear plant. Japan called China's action totally unacceptable and urged it to repeal the ban immediately. Some Japanese officials have suggested that Japan may file a complaint with the World Trade Organization, WTO, with support from the United States. Japan plans to explain the safety of the released water at diplomatic forums, including the ASEAN summit and G20 summit this month. Additionally, Japan has asked China to hold discussions based on the provisions of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership RCP, trade pact. The ban has had a significant impact on Japan's seafood exports to China, its largest market for aquatic products. To support the domestic fisheries industry, Japan will allocate over $682 million. Taiwan President leaves for visit to last African ally Eswatini. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen has departed for a visit to Eswatini, Taiwan's last African ally Taiwan currently has formal diplomatic ties with only 13 countries, most of which are smaller, less developed nations in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. Tsai emphasized Taiwan's commitment to engage confidently with the world and demonstrate its positive influence. During her visit to Eswatini, Tsai will mark the country's 55th anniversary of independence and celebrate 55 years of bilateral relations. Eswatini is nearly surrounded by South Africa, which Chinese President Xi Jinping visited recently. Unlike visits to Latin America, Tsai's trip to Eswatini does not require transits via the United States, avoiding potential tensions with China. Myanmar's jailed ex-leader Aung San Suu Kyi ailing, source. Myanmar's detained former leader Aung San Suu Kyi is reportedly suffering from health issues, including swelling in her gums, difficulty eating, lightheadedness, and vomiting. Her request to have an outside physician examine her has been denied by the country's military rulers, and she has been receiving medical treatment from a prison's department doctor. Su Chi is currently under house arrest, facing 27 years of detention related to 19 criminal charges. Myanmar's exiled National Unity Government has called on the international community to pressure the junta for the health care and security of all political detainees. Numerous governments have called for Su Chi's unconditional release and imposed sanctions on Myanmar's military. Cuba uncovers human trafficking of Cubans to fight for Russia in Ukraine. Cuba has uncovered a human trafficking ring that coerced its citizens into fighting for Russia in the war in Ukraine. The Cuban Foreign Ministry stated that Cuban authorities are working to neutralize and dismantle this network, which has operated both within Cuba and Russia. The statement did not provide specific details but indicated that efforts were underway to stop these activities. Russia has not commented on these allegations. This revelation raises concerns about the recruitment of foreign fighters in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine.